what I want to do is I want to take a, a moment and just talk a little more in depth uh, about something that we covered on Sunday. When we were in our Power Today series, we were in Acts chapter 10, and Acts 10, 38, a great verse in that chapter, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. Something that's interesting, and as you read the commentators, is Luke has an understanding that sickness is primarily from the devil, that it is the work of the enemy. Satan works in three ways to bring sickness and suffering. We talked about this. First of all, directly he causes sickness. When you read the Gospel of Mark, 25% of the miracles in Mark's Gospel are the result of people being set free from the oppression of an evil spirit. Second, Satan indirectly uses the natural results of a fallen, sinful world to cause sickness. He uses bacteria. He uses malnutrition. He uses toxins. He uses evil behavior as, as people harm one another and do things to one another that causes illness, that causes pain, that causes sickness. Satan uses that. We also know this, and let me just say this relative to, you, if you want a picture of how it works, and, and we don't fully understand it, but Job chapter 1, you get a very good picture of how Satan is involved in some things. Number three, Satan tempts people to fall into sin that results in sickness and suffering. You remember at Corinth, Paul writes the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and he's talking about the Lord's Supper, and he says, some of you are coming in, and you're eating in an unworthy manner. In other words, you're not considering people around you, so there's bitterness, there's, there's competition, there's envy, there's drunkenness. There's a lack of concern for the needs or the feelings of others. And Paul says this, because of that, some of you are sick and some have even died. So Satan can tempt people to do things in their life that result in discipline. So generally speaking, sickness is the result of the devil's attack, which should make the is it God's will to heal question very easy to answer. Too many times Christians are too busy trying to figure out if it's the will of God when I think a better way is to say, what would Jesus do if he were standing there? What would he do? We have no record of Jesus not healing somebody who wanted to be healed. Which I think is instructive for us when you look at the number of miracles in the gospel and his interaction with people, it gives us uh, an insight into the heart of God and the activity of God that he desires to do in our life. Now the question is, if sickness is primarily the result of the enemy's attack on people, the question then becomes, does that change how we pray for people? And I believe it does. I, I, I believe it influences how we ought to think about praying for the sick. So I praise God for what's happening. I mean, you know, God answers prayer. That's to be sure. But that doesn't mean we just continue to do what we've been doing without growing in our understanding of how God desires to work in us and through us, right? The two most common kinds of prayer to use when praying for the sick are petition prayer and command prayer. And we need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit as to which one to use. I'm going to explain them so you, we understand what we're talking about. When it comes to petition prayer, it's a request to heal that is addressed to God. So here would be some examples. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to mend this torn ligament. That's a petition. You're petitioning God. You're requesting from God to do a healing in Jesus' name. Or, Father, I 
release your power to heal Julie's back in Jesus' name. That's a, that's a petition prayer. You're asking God to do it. The command prayer is just that. It's a command addressed to a condition of the body, a part of the body, to a troubling spirit of illness or pain. So it would look like this. In the name of Jesus, I command this tumor to dissolve. Here would be another one. In the name of Jesus, spine be straight, be healed. Here would be another one. In the name of Jesus, I command every afflicting spirit to get out of Jim's body. Because sometimes, and it's not that Jim is demonized, and it's not that Jim is messing with the occult. That could be the case, and Jim's hypothetical. So if your name's Jim, we love you, and good on you. Just go by James tonight, okay? Um, the idea is sometimes that illness, it's, it's demonically induced without any permission or activity on the part of the person who is being afflicted. I mean, does Satan attack people? Yes, he does. And there are times that in God's sovereignty, he allows that attack for his purposes, his glory, but he also heals in the midst of that. Now, when we talk about this and we say, okay, there's petition prayer, and that's almost a given because that's the way most prayer happens. Most people say, Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus to do this, and there's nothing wrong with that, but there are times where the command prayer would be preferable in a situation. In fact, one of the things I would suggest to you is that when it comes to the New Testament, you see virtually no petition prayer relative to healing. It's very interesting. So if we're going to take our cue from the Bible and not from what we think or what we're comfortable from, then we have to evaluate how it is that we're praying. And I'm, I'm not trying to, to um, in any way confuse people, but I am, I am wanting us to think in terms of what does the Bible say and align what we're doing with the Word of God because God has given us the Word of God to teach and instruct us. Amen? So in Mark chapter 9 and verse 25, an example, this would be from Jesus' ministry, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. So his inability to talk, his inability to hear was related to an evil spirit. That doesn't mean everybody who has those issues has an evil spirit, but some may. In Mark chapter 7 and verse 32, some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged him to place his hand on him. After he took him aside away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. Now, let me just say this. I would be real cautious on you doing that, okay? <laughs> Maybe, maybe you really make sure you're deep in the Lord when you do that. So he looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. And the man's ears were opened and his tongue was loosed and he began speaking plainly. In Matthew chapter 12, another command going from that place, he went to their synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. They asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He then said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out and it was completely restored. So it was a call for him to do something that, result, that he could not do that resulted in his healing. Now, people will say, well, that's Jesus, but Jesus gives us an example so that you and I will follow in his footsteps. And you see this same kind of command healing in the New, New Testament. You see it in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 3, Peter tells the, the man at the gate, beautiful, get up. Yeah. I don't have silver and gold, but what I do have in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. That's a command healing. You see it again in Acts chapter 9. Peter traveled about the country. He went to visit the saints in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, a paralytic who had been bedridden for eight years. Aeneas, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and take care of your mat. And immediately Aeneas got up. 
And all those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. In Acts chapter 14 and verse 8, this from the ministry of the Apostle Paul in Lystra, there, was, there sat a man crippled in his feet who was lame from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had the faith to be healed, and called out, stand up on your feet. That's a command. And at that, the man jumped up and began to walk. So command prayers are very much a part of New Testament theology and teaching relative to healing. What I want to encourage you to do is to be sensitive to the Lord. If you say, well, you know, I'm, I'm more comfortable with the petition prayer. It's really good that you have gained some facility with that kind of prayer. But let's not live in our comfort zone if the Bible's saying there's more. Are you with me? You, you and I can be comfortable with one part, but if we see in the Bible command praying and we see it frequently and we see it repeatedly and we see several different personalities doing it, then it's God saying, this is a way to pray for people effectively. And I'm less interested in my own personal comfort, and I'm sure you are as well, than we are in seeing people receive from God that which he wants to do. And so I want to encourage you to, to just say, Lord, is this something where I would just ask the Father in Jesus' name, or is this something where I would command in Jesus' name for healing to take place? Let me just give you some um, scenarios where command prayers are appropriate. Number one, where there's been a word of knowledge for healing. We've seen that a lot. It's, it's, it is honestly the way God is working right now, which is tremendous. I don't think it's the only way God works, and I don't think you have to have a word of knowledge to be healed. But when there is a word of knowledge, if it applies to you, step out and receive it in Jesus' name. A second time would be when petition prayers have been tried and there's been no visible progress. So you're asking the Father to do something and you're not seeing any movement on that. Then I think a, a very reasonable thing is to say, Lord, how do I need to pray for this? Is, is this the result of an evil spirit? Is this something that I, in the, in the name of Jesus, need to command so that God is working in you as he's working in that person, right? Third, casting out an afflicting spirit would be uh, typically a scenario where there would be a command. And I think over all of this, when you're led by the Holy Spirit to make such a command, so we always want to be walking in a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit and say, God, what do you want to do in this moment? I think it's a good thing to pause for a moment before you pray to allow the Lord to speak to you in the event that he has something to say to you. You're not always going to hear him uh, speak to your heart in that moment, but you may, and in those times, it can be very helpful in seeing that person have God's healing power released in their body. Are you with me on that? So let me add this as well. Remember to always pray or command in the name of Jesus. Jesus didn't just commission us to pray for the sick. We're to heal the sick through the power of his name. I mean, in Mark's gospel, just a few scriptures here, these signs will accompany those who believe in my name, they will drive out demons. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. How do they do it? In his name. They're going to place your hands on sick people and they're going to get well. I think it's very good for us to remember again that in that, that discourse that Jesus gave at the Last Supper, he's eaten with the disciples, and now in John chapter 14, 15, and 16, I mean, this is just uh, a matter of, of hours before he is arrested, tried, and crucified. He's talking to the disciples, and he's telling them the things that are on his heart that are most important to him, and it's very interesting. In John 14, 12, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing. That's Jesus' desire for you and I, is to boldly believe that there's power in his name and to do the things that he did. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. 
And then he tells us how to do that. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. This is an amazing statement. If I wasn't a Christian, this would make me want to be a Christian. You say, well, you know, John, it doesn't mean exactly that. See, that's what a lot of people have been taught. You know, I've said it before many times. It's like the, a lot of people are like the pharmaceutical commercials. They, they have all these disclaimers, caveats, all these. Well, it's not true if this, 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 this. And they're more caught up in when it's not true than the fact that it is true. And what's interesting is Jesus will make this statement five times in one message without qualifiers. I would encourage you, if Jesus is not worried about the qualifiers, why are you? If he didn't specialize them in them, in them, why do you? If the apostles who heard it had the whole New Testament to straighten us out, why didn't they if it was critical? Jesus said, I'll do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. Then in verse 14, because people are like, is that really true? Yes, you may ask me, for anything in my name, and I will do it. Isn't that amazing? Then we read on in John chapter 15 and verse 16. You didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Petition prayer right there. Father, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus to heal I'm asking you to, to heal this cancer. I'm asking you to heal this person's bone in Jesus' name. John chapter 16, verse 23, in that day you'll no longer ask me anything. I tell you the truth, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Listen, there's power in the name of Jesus. And until now, you've not asked for anything in my name. Ask implied in my name, and you'll receive, and your joy will be complete. You and I were made for answered prayer. The reason why a lot of Christians aren't happy is because they're not seeing God do anything in their life. One of the great keys and sources of joy in our life is, listen, when I share the testimonies and you hear that, you're like, wow, that's so amazing. Answered prayer will bring joy in your life, make a difference in your life. And when we're asking in Jesus' name, what we're saying is, Jesus, I believe this is what you would do if you were standing right here, and he is with us. And finally, let me just say this. As we're praying, when you go to God, make sure you're thanking the Lord. Don't wait until after it happens, but you can thank God even as you're praying for somebody. And God, I thank you that you're the God who heals. I thank you. Listen, thanksgiving is the key to the presence of God and the throne room of God. Enter his gates. How? With thanksgiving. Use the key of thanksgiving to get in his presence. Thank you so much for joining James River Church on our YouTube channel. Our prayer is that you were encouraged and your faith was strengthened today. And we want to let you know that we'd love for you to be a part of our online family. As well, we'd love if you subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell for notifications. You'll be so glad you did because we're always putting out great sermons, new worship content, and it helps you know when we go live for our weekly services. We hope you have an amazing day and thank you again for watching. God bless.